Today is December 7th, 2016. We are at the to town office, the workplace of Forrest Holt's Apple in Melbourne. Today's interview crew is, is on audio recorder, Kersley Smith, on still camera, Ben Conn, on video camera, Ben Kalowski, and which I'm the interviewer, Josh Mustang. I'd like to ask you a few questions about your personal background. Sure. Have you always lived in Marlboro? Um, most of my life. I lived in New Mexico for a year. Um, and I, I went to college down in the Hudson Valley in New York, so I mostly lived there for those four years. So, mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, I went to Marlboro School just like you. Do you live in the same house you grew up in, or a different one? Nope. I live in the house next door to the house that I grew up in. <laughs> uh, yeah, and that's a whole story in and of itself. But yeah, no, I live I live right next to the school. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm neighbors with. I live next door to my parents because I grew up in their house, obviously. And, uh, so Where's I haven't this? fallen far from the tree. Where's the specifically? I don't know how to say that word. Specifically, yeah. Yeah. In town, do you live now? Um, so I live at 2756 Route 9, which is the little white house on the left if you're going down from here towards the school. Mm -hmm. Just past Applewoods, which is where my folks live. What is your physical... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're just editing this out. Marlboro Town Office. This is Forrest. Hi Ruth, how are you? I'm okay. Yeah. God. Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, Clarence Boston um, has seen this uh, a blaze on some trees in his yeah, it's painted orange, like stripe up the side of a tree, um, and he was he was concerned because he didn't he didn't put the stripes there, um, and so uh, he asked the listers to come look at it, and we so we measured along the road to find uh, you know where his parcel boundaries were, and we found that the tree that was marked was actually on his on Clarence's property. Um, Yes, exactly. Yeah, just uphill in the little white uh, cape, um, and so so that's Clarence was just say, trying to figure out well who did this and what did they, what were their intentions and did they know that the that it was on my land, um, and then uh, I got a, a email back from Bill just saying you know to, saying to me hey you know it's no problem Clarence can go ahead and and do whatever and I know that Bill has been in touch with Clarence as well. So I think I think it's resolved, but I just we just weren't sure. And Clarence was like, uh, because Fred Nutting, who's his neighbor to the, you know, behind, or he's the next one up, but his land goes behind there. Um, he had done a bunch of cutting, and Clarence felt like, well, he knew, he thought they knew where the boundaries were. But these things are are a little murky. So in the email, there are a bunch of different maps that you guys can refer to if you want. And if you if you have time to come in, I'm happy to sit and, um, you know, show you what we found and and talk more about it. But does that, does that in, <laughs> in a nutshell answer your question? Okay. Okay, Ruth, take care. Hey. You're welcome. What is your physical home address? Uh, I said it before, 2756 Route 9. Mm -hmm. yep. How far from your childhood home is your current home? <laughs> uh, boy, I could probably jump on the computer and figure out. I think it's probably 300 feet, something like that. Not far. Yeah. Maybe two snowball throws. Uh, maybe three. Probably three snowball throws. I have a big one. Yeah, a big arm. Nice. Okay. Who built the house you live in now, and when was it built? Sure. Uh, my house was built in 1958 by Luke Dalrymple. Uh, Luke Dalrymple was, 
I don't know that he was born, he may have been born in Halifax, but he was from here. And his house is actually, when you go down uh, South Road here, when you, when you rise up again right before you come to Route 9, there's a white house on the left. That's, that was his house. And um, he was a carpenter. He did a lot of, he built a lot of the, um, or renovated a lot of the buildings at Marlboro College um, in, 19, in the 1940s to make the college be what it is today. Uh, and so he was a carpenter, and he built that house for his sister, Jenny Downer. Uh, and she, she was again, you know, a Vermonter, back multiple generations, and um, she was a great lady. And when I was a kid, I mowed her lawn, and shoveled snow and stuff like that for her. So she was, she was a neighbor, and she was a friend. Uh, so anyway, so we live in her house, and uh, you know, the first couple nights that we stayed there, uh, you know, when we started renting it, was a little strange because I kept feeling like she should be there. Like, what am I doing here? <laughs> Anyway, it was pretty cool, but but yeah, my wife and I bought the house in um, 2000, I think, so we've owned it for 16 years, and uh, in 2005, I built an addition on the front, uh, and we've, you know, continued working on it. Houses are like that. <laughs> they go on and on and on. Mm -hmm. Aside from Marlboro, where else have you lived as an adult? Sure. Uh, yeah, so I lived in New Mexico. I went to college for a year. I went, drove out to New Mexico by myself, um, and I, I studied um, photography in college. And so I went there um, to just travel to a new place, and it was, it was quite an experience. I lived in a city for the first time in my life. And, uh, and then I also lived in the Hudson Valley for a couple of years, um, like I said, where I, around where I went to college. Mostly, I've lived in in this town specifically. I don't. I've never. I haven't lived anywhere else in Vermont. So. How would you describe yourself as, as a child? As a child? Yeah. Um. I don't know. I love being outside mostly, and I spent endless hours riding my bike, and playing in the woods, and uh, you know stuff that country kids do, <laughs> uh, you know, play baseball and stuff like that. Um, I don't think, yeah, and then I went to, I went to um, the Brattleboro High School, uh, Brattleboro Union High School, and, you know, that was an experience too. It's a big, it's a big adjustment to go from Marlboro School where you've been in school with the same couple kids, and you go down there and there's a thousand kids, it's a big adjustment. Um, but let's see, how am I going to kid? I mean, yeah, I, I mean, other than that, um, I don't know. I'm not to, I don't know. I mean, I could go off on all kinds of tangents, but maybe it's not appropriate for this. So go ahead, what's your next question? May I ask you how old you are now? Sure, I'm 42 years old. Yeah. How many siblings do you have and what are their names? Where do you, they live now? Sure. I have one brother who's older than me, and he's two years older than me, and he lives in Williamstown, Mass. Uh, and he uh, he's the head of a uh, private high school down just in, into New York State, so nearby there. What are your parents' names, and what have been their careers? Where do they live? Um, so my, my parents live at, at Apple Woods. Right on Route Nine there, uh, David and Michelle Holtz Apple. They uh, they have been um, woodworkers for my entire life, uh, and but uh, my father also taught fifth and sixth grade at Marlboro School for uh, twenty five years or something like that. But, um, but mostly mostly they've always they've always worked with wood, so. I grew up with, with plenty of that kind of stuff and, and making stuff in the shop. It's tons of fun. What high school did you go to? I went to Brattleboro High School, in Brattleboro Union High School. And what year did you graduate? Graduate From high school? Yeah. Uh, I graduated in 1992. So I graduated from Marlboro School in 88, 1988, and then, yeah. What did you do during the summer after you finished high school? Uh, in the summer after high school, 
well, later that later in the year, see, I, I applied to colleges, but I didn't get into the ones that I wanted to go to, which was kind of heartbreaking. But so I had a whole year off, and it actually turned out really well because I traveled. I went to uh, I traveled to Jamaica and I traveled to Costa Rica, and both of those were amazing experiences. And in Costa Rica, actually, I worked for the Park Service there, so I got to um, they the the country would. Um, you know, the park service would travel, would, would um, pay for my travel to go to the various parks. Uh, you know, just like you've been to state parks in Vermont, right? You know what I'm talking about? Anyway, there are people there, they're camping, they're hiking on the trails and stuff like that. So Woodford. what I would, yeah, like Woodford. It's exactly like Woodford, except it's in Costa Rica and everyone speaks Spanish. <laughs> and it's a rainforest or there are lots of different uh, ecological zones there. But um, anyway, so yeah, that was a really cool experience. What is your partner's name? Jessica Whites. And, yeah, go ahead. Where is she from? Jessica grew up in Washington, D.C. Um, her mother and her grandparents were from Vermont. Um, so that's kind of interesting. But, she, yeah, she grew up in the city. Uh, and then, yeah, she and I have been together since 1995. So we met in college. How did you two meet? <laughs> We met in college. We were both in the photography department at, at Barton College. So. What career has she been involved with? Jess has, she's a librarian. Um, she's worked for a long time at the library in Brattleboro, Brooks Memorial Library. Um, she's done other things. She and I both ran the Insight Photography Project, uh, which is in Brattleboro. That was probably 15 years ago, something like that. Um, Let's see what else she's done. She's done a lot of things, but but she's a librarian. That's what she's what she was trained for. Went to school for. What are your children's names? How old are they? Sure. I have a son, Leander, who's 15, um, and my daughter, Althea, is uh, 12. And I think she's in your class, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it seems familiar. <laughs> yep. Your daughter is currently a student at the Marlboro School. Who have been her teachers there, and what grade is she in presently? Uh, Thea is in sixth grade. Her current teacher is Pamela Burke. She's had Pam because of the way the classes have shifted around. This is actually her third year with Pam. Um, before that, she had Erica and Erica Morse uh, for third and part of fourth grade, I think. Uh, and then she had Judy Lang uh, in first grade and second grade, and um, Ellen was her kindergarten teacher. Your son attended the Marlboro School. Who were his teachers there? Um, he had he had the same teachers, except um, David was his fifth and sixth grade teacher, so he had his grandfather as his teacher. It was interesting for all involved, I'm sure. <laughs> Oh, and then, and then, because Althea hasn't gotten to junior high yet, but Leander had Tim and Rachel also in junior high. You attended the Marlboro School when you were a child. Who were your teachers then? Uh, let's see. I had Betty Ann Runge was my kindergarten teacher. Uh, Robin Miller was my first and second grade teacher. John Esau was my third and fourth grade teacher. Connie Barton was fifth and sixth, and Bruce Cole was uh, seventh and eighth. What are some similarities you recognize from your own experience at the Mulberg School and in the way the school seems to you today? Hmm. Boy, it's really different being a parent than being a kid. So, you know, lots of lots of things are similar. It's a small school. Um, you can't hide from the teachers. <laughs> um, I thought they could. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, so it, it has it has lots of the same things in that it's a small school and that has that has many good benefits, uh, and it also has some drawbacks because um, sometimes you know you have kids that you've gone to school with forever and ever and ever, and it can be hard to move beyond those relationships sometimes. And going to high school helps because then you realize, wow, there's a big world out there. What are some of the differences? You between Marlborough School then and now? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, I don't know. I gotta pass on that one. Uh, it's too late in the day. I, I mean, I'd have to think about that. <laughs> Oh, what high school did you attend? Yeah, Brattleboro Union High School. I think it might mean what's college. Oh, college? I don't know. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, I mentioned I mentioned that. It's Bard, Bard College. And I, and I went for one year to the University of New Mexico. What did you do between finishing high school and going to college? I explained that one already. Right? Yeah. About traveling and going to Costa Rica and stuff like that. Where did you go to college? What did you study there? Um, I studied photography. That was that's what my degree is in, which has very little to do with being a town clerk, but that's life. Things change. I'd like to ask you some questions about your working life as the town clerk of Marlboro, a lister, and as a photographer. Let's begin with your career as a town clerk. Sure. In what year did you become a town clerk? Um, I took over from the previous town clerk, Nora Wilson, uh, in 2013. So that's, I'm, I'm about to start my fifth year. This is the end of my fourth year being a town clerk. Um, was, I think I was a, her, a, one of her assistants for about four or five years before um, taking over the job. And I'm, a, I'm an elected official, so the townspeople, we have, we have elections. Uh, every town meeting, and so I'm elected by the, the voters of the town to to do this job. Um, How old were you then? In 2013. Well, when you started. Oh, job. I I started working for the town in, in I think it was 2002, and I took over as I took uh, I finished out the term for Sylvia Johnson, who was a lister. Uh, and I, so I started as a lister in 2002, and I've done that since, so I've been go I'm going on, I don't know, uh, whatever it is, was it 20, 2016? <laughs> 14, 15 years, something like that, yeah, so, so a while. And, well, and the, the list, well, maybe you'll ask me the question, yeah, go ahead. What other jobs have you had as an adult for being elected town clerk? Oh, I've done a lot of things. I've worked on a carpentry crew. I. Uh, I've cooked in a restaurant. I've been a waiter in a restaurant. I've done dishes in a restaurant. I worked at the Whetstone Inn for about 15 years. I've painted houses, uh, uh, and I and I work as a photographer. So, a whole bunch of things. How did you get to be the town clerk? And then it says, please explain the process you had to go through to become a clerk. Sure. Uh, well, st I mean, being a list. So what the listers, um, the listers' job I'll is. Probably ask you, listers. Yeah. No, but this is it. It'll make sense. Okay. So what the listers do is they they go to all the properties in town because we were the tax assessors. So um, and the school is run on money on tax money that that townspeople are paying, but the. The, what the people are paying is based on what their property is, so that's why it's called property tax. And so, so our job as listers is to go to all the properties and measure and list them and come up with a market value for them. That then raises the amount of taxes needed to run the school and to run the town so that you know, we have the roads are plowed and maintained uh, and the buildings are maintained. Um, and, but a lot of the money goes to fund the school. What was the original question again, before I blather on? What was the <laughs> one that you just asked me? How did you get to be the town clerk? Right, the process. I think I explained that fairly well. So I, I took over, I ran the, I, I had had one year of Nora's term that was sort of a, an appointed position because I was going to, uh, you know, take over the job from her. Or it was for a period of time, but then I had to run for election. Because that's that's the way it works is is it's an elected position. So I was appointed initially for the first year to finish out her term, and I had been her assistant for five years before that. And then once I was elected, then you know I'm in as long as I can stand it, or unless I do something really bad and people vote me out, or someone runs against me, it could happen. It's not like this, but it could happen. How did you get to be the town clerk? 
how have you learned what you need, you need to know to be a town clerk? Um, mostly by listening and by working with Nora, who Nora was town clerk for I think 24 years. She was excellent, and and uh, all the land records in the back. So that's a record of the deeds uh, up to, to all the property in town. Uh, you know, things have changed hands many, many, many times. Um, so there's that stuff. There's all the vital records. So births, marriages, and deaths in town. I'm responsible for recording all of those. Um, so basically, by doing the job is how I've learned it. But working as the assistant, where I have uh, not not nearly as much responsibility, but I have to know how to do stuff. You know, do the all the different aspects of the job. Um, taught me how to do it. So on the job training mostly. And the thing about a small town is. What, I, what has been easy for me because I grew up here is I know a lot of the people. And um, when I first moved back here from college uh, in 1999, um, I did a photography project for the Historical Society. And we, I photographed 200 different families standing in front of their houses. So the people are outside in front of their homes. And um, so I got to meet three quarters of the town by doing that project and one of the selectmen at the time, Dave Matt, um, asked me if I would join the board of listers, tax assessors, because he said, well you already know a lot of these people, they know who you are. Um, so, so a lot of parts of my job have been easy for me because I know a lot about where stuff is in town and who, who lived there before and that kind of stuff. So those things really help. But as far as the the, the aspects of the job, like land recording and all of the details, it's just I've had to learn by doing. How would you describe the job in its various parts? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think I just touched on that. And um, I'm trying to think of what else. Um, you know, the, in a lot of ways, the town clerk is like, I, I'm like the center of the administration of the town. And the select board, um, is they're the legislative body, so they make a lot of decisions about the budget and you know uh, things like that about how the mon how the money is going to be spent. And um, Linda Peters, who's not here right now, she's the treasurer, so her job is to pay uh, pay the employees, but also you know figuring out the budgets. How much how much are we going to spend this coming year on sand for the winter roads? You know stuff, <laughs> stuff like that. She works with the road the road form and David Elliott. And uh, you know, figures that kind of stuff out. Um, so there's a lot. There are a lot of facets to the job. Um, but I think some of the parts that I enjoy the most are um, are having to do with the land records because I just think it's fascinating. I could I can pull out a book from uh, 1780 and we could read a deed. So a deed is a description of a piece of property from 225 years ago, and it's written in the town clerk's hand in ink on a piece of paper. Sounds simple, but it's pretty amazing. That's 250 years ago, and um, so I, I really enjoy the the historic that historical aspect of it. Um, and then also, my job is because I'm the person that answers the phone. You know, when people look on the internet or something and they want to find. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. There it is. Uh, Marlboro Town Office. This is for us. Hey, Ed. How are you today? Not bad. Twice now. Sure. Oh yeah. Yeah, I can look it up. I think it was around three hundred and twenty thousand. Yeah, but that was that was uh, in, um, Yeah, I think that's pretty reasonable. Um, let's see, this record that I have in front of me doesn't. We the last valuation we had was two ninety nine, and that was when the store was up and running, and the, and the current owner has not been the most. Uh, let's say. 
you know, it's been, the communication's been difficult. Let me put that in. Ah, uh, okay. That's good to hear. <laughs> it's a two-way street, I guess. I mean, you know, it's one of those things where, the, like, the, you know, he had the, the sort of auction process, and it wasn't really clear what the outcome of that was, to me, anyway. Um, but, but anyway, I mean, that seems like a, a very reasonable price. And I think that, the, I know that the store committee had an appraisal done of it, and I think the appraiser felt like there was no question that the location has potential. And, you know, and it's just a question of what the business plan would be. Yeah, and it was, it was in the 280s. I think we have a copy of it here if you wanted to come and look at it. Yeah, my memory is it was, it was something, it was slightly below what we had it valued at. But again, there, you know, uh, uh, that was at the time. So it's as of whatever that date was. Now, the longer it sits there, it just you know, depreciates rapidly. Um, I believe also with the gas tanks, I know Mary Sargent has said that um, that's, that gas tanks are not a permitted use in that location. Okay, perfect. I mean, it doesn't mean it's impossible, but it just means that, you know, it means, you know, legwork, but you're familiar with that. <laughs> Yes, it is. No, oh, yeah, well, nothing's, I mean, nothing's changed until we actually vote on it. I think the whole thing has to go before the select board before anything. So there's, there's time for change, more changes to it. I see. I see. Well, that's what a variance is for, you know. Is to, I mean, so it, I mean, the question would be: Would the landowners behind could some kind of deal be struck whereby you, you know, do a lot line adjustment and increase the size of it? I mean, I'm with you on that. Mm -hmm. You know, I yeah, I don't know, but I mean, the thing is, is it's an accepted use because that's what's been there, and so it's yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the letter of the law, but I'm just saying, you know, that's it's just finding finding a way to make it go because I think obviously there's a need for it. People have adjusted. But, uh, Yes, I believe the tanks are up to date. In fact, I know I recorded something that said as much that they had been. I, we did look at um, that they that they had been inspected within the last two years. So, uh, you know, I don't. I have no reason to believe that it couldn't. They couldn't be reused or used. Uh, they probably have to be maintained. But I have no idea what's involved in that. But it's on. Yeah. Yeah. Right, sure. Sure, yeah, right, exactly. I mean, it's worth less without them, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, Ed, if you have time, I'm here all day tomorrow. If you have time and you want to stop over, we can look through the documents that we have here that are, and I don't know if that, you know, helps you work through the process. Okay. I'll be here 9 to 4, so anytime in there that works for you is fine. Okay, see ya. Bye. Alright, sorry about that. Wait. What? Okay. Uh, where was I? I think you point chat's fun. <laughs> Oh yeah, I was talking about answering the phone. The yeah, you know, the, one of the things that I lo that is just crazy about this job is, so I have open hours, obviously. You never know who's going to walk through the door, 
what they're going to ask you. I have fielded the most insane questions. One of the, the first summer that I was clerk, it was a quiet summer afternoon, and I got a phone call that <clears throat> someone had spotted on Cowpath 40 Road that there were 12 three to 400 pound pigs that were loose. <laughs> and they were going towards this woman's garden, and she was just like, what? That was pretty crazy. So that kind of thing happens. You know, we have, um, uh, I sell dog licenses also. So dogs that are registered in the town, and they have a valid rabies certificate. We have, a, we have a, about 200 licensed animals. Um, so that's interesting. You to, don't always meet the dogs, but we get to talk to people about their pets. And uh, anyway, what's your next question? What are some of the personal characteristics that a town clerk should have? Um, the main thing about being a town clerk for me is I treat every single person who I meet the same. And I try to treat them fairly, and I try to listen to their problems, and I try to help them. That's my job. I'm a public servant. You know, and you, you follow that? So it means that people come in with a wide range of problems or issues or just like this guy who was calling about the uh, what used to be the store down here, Sweeties. And he's asking me questions of, yeah, now it's closed. Uh, but Yeah, I saw. Yeah, you drive by all the time, I'm sure. So he's, his, his son is thinking maybe he wants to buy it and open it as a store again. So I'm trying to help him, well, you have to look in the land records and see what happened, and blah, 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 blah. It'd be good. It'd be good. It'd be good. So I'm going to try to encourage him. I'm going to try to say, look, well, let's check out all these, you know, all these details and figure it out. Okay. Knowing what to do as clerk is one thing, but you've also got to serve the people who come in the office. Those can be two different skills. How have you learned to do both of them? Just by practicing. <laughs> you know, and I've been in plenty of situations where they're, it's pretty stressful, um, particularly with taxpayers, people who are, who are angry because they think that we valued their property too high. They, they may have valid reasons and they may not, um, but a lot of times, um, you know, Linda and I are on the front lines as far as people who are pissed off about something and they have details. And you kind of have to take their information and, and help them out. And so sometimes that's really difficult because um, they could be really rude and insulting and it's hard to say, okay, well, you're, you're another person and you deserve just as much respect as the next person. But um, that, that can be pretty challenging. And you pretty much answer the next two questions. Okay, that's fine. I mean, another thing I could I could relate this experience. So, um, so one of the other parts of my job is that I'm the um, I'm the presiding officer of all the elections that happen here. So we just had an election recently, right? Um, and in fact, there were three elections this year. Uh, and then and in town meeting, which was back in March, we had a situation where there was a there was a write-in candidate. Um, for the one of the select board seats, and it just we really got off the rails, and there was behavior that was um, not acceptable to me, and certainly as a as a relatively young clerk, I didn't I didn't handle it maybe as well as I could have, but I learned a tremendous amount from it, um, and and I would say overall administering those elections is not one of my favorite part of the job. I find it, it's it can be pretty difficult. And um, you, essentially, you have to, you're the boss. And when you're, when you're the boss in a situation where people aren't uh, listening to you, it's very frustrating and, and it's stressful. Um, but we, we got ourselves through that situation and I think the entire town learned a lot from that experience. So I think in the end it was a really good thing and it spoke to a lot of uh, anger that people have about the democratic process, which is not perfect. <clears throat> what have been some of the more, more unusual problems people have brought to you? <laughs> yeah, the pigs one was good. Uh, I'm trying to think of other things. Um, well, um, just in the last couple days, 
um, there's been there are two two neighbors and there's kind of a property dispute as to where their uh, where the boundaries of their property is and um, so there I am trying to mediate between these two guys and saying well you know the map shows this and then we went out the listers and I we went out and measured it and trying to figure out you know no one's wrong but there are facts and then there's supposition you know and facts are what we try to work in only because everything else is kind of he said she said you know and those kinds of things get pretty dicey pretty quickly because so so in a way I have to work kind of like a judge you know saying well I'm presented with this information and I'm presented with this information I'm trying to help you both realize like what's at stake here what are we talking about so um, I do I do a fair amount of that kind of thing. Oftentimes it's just phone calls. You know, people call and they ask me questions, and I answer them as best I can and try to help them or say, hey, you should go talk to so and so about this problem. Or, or my favorite one is you need to talk to a lawyer <laughs> because I'm not a lawyer. And uh, Nora Nora, who was town clerk before, I mean, she would joke with people all the time that she'd say, well. I'm a, I'm a lawyer without a license, you know, I can give advice, the advice is free, but it's not a legal opinion, you know, it's not, it doesn't have that force. But, I see a lot of stuff go on, and um, just try to help people out. Aside from the work you do in the office, what are some of the other duties and responsibilities of the town court? Yeah, um... So let me see, let me try to come up with a comprehensive list. It's pretty long. So there's there's all the land records. <clears throat> there are all the survey maps, which are maps that surveyors have made of property. Um, let's see. There are all the grand lists. So that's a list that the listers produce every single year of all the property of the entire town. We have to do that every single year, and that's what the tax bills are based on. Um, let's see. Then we have all the vital records. So that's um, births, deaths, and marriages. Um, an interesting story in that um, the Department of Motor Vehicles in the state now has ramped up what they require for documentation if you want to get a driver's license. And so I've, I've helped a number of um, sort of elderly people who like they've lived here their entire lives and they're like, they're distraught. They come in here and they're like, I have to get my, can you, can you make me a copy of my birth certificate so I can bring it to the Department of Motor Vehicles to prove that I am who I am? And they're outraged. And it's pretty cool to be able to go back into the vault, find their name in the index, make a copy for them, and they're on their way and they have just what they need. So that kind of thing makes me pretty in happy. In the vault, yeah. I think we should probably walk through the vault in a little while. No, I don't, but I don't know if you guys can, it'll be hard to move the stuff, maybe we'll wait we until Gordon and David come back. We but, can do it. Like. But you should definitely, yeah, take some still pictures and maybe some video footage, I could give you a little tour. Um, let me see, what else? So then the dog licenses, I explained that. Um, marriage licenses is pretty interesting. That, that often is fascinating. Um, sometimes people walk right, walk in the door, they don't, I don't know that they're coming at all. They walk in and they ask to buy a marriage license. And they can do that. Okay, so then they have to fill out a form, and then I can produce a marriage license, and they either have a justice of the peace or a minister, or they have someone that's going to legally marry them, um, so I can facilitate that for them. So, and births, uh, you know, it's pretty interesting because, so there are lots of your classmates where I could go pull their birth certificate right now, you'd see what time they were born, where they were born, what their name was when they were born, that kind of stuff. Let's do that. And so, but, but it's interesting because it's like, you know, I'm the holder of that information and I'm happy to share it with whomever, but you also realize, like, this is important stuff because, uh, you know, imagine you moved away and you needed your birth certificate for something. It's pretty cool to be able to help someone out. Um, why did you want to become town clerk in the first place? Um, I just kind of fell into it. I mean, I think I kind of explained how, from being a lister, um, you know, I know a lot of, I, having visited all the, and I've also done, as a lister, I've done two reappraisals of the entire town, which means visiting every single property and every single structure in the town. So I've done that twice now, so I know the town pretty well. <laughs> 
so being a town clerk is kind of a natural extension of that because for me when someone calls and they've got a question on such and such a property in such and such a place, I know exactly what they're talking about. And I've got pictures and you know the listers files are, are really pretty good. <clears throat> What are some of the reasons why you have continued to want to clerk? Be the town clerk? I, I, <laughs> says, I enjoy it. I mean, I, at the end of the day, I enjoy it. And um, I think that, you know, it has, it has like any job, there are parts of it that I really like, and there are parts of it that I don't like that much, and you do it anyway. You know, and, and a lot of the, <clears throat> in Vermont, there are 251 towns. And in Vermont, government is done at town level. So there's Marlboro, there's Guilford, there's Halifax, there's Brattleboro. Each of those towns has their own town clerk, and they're each responsible for those, all of those records. So the thing that's amazing about that is that any citizen of this town, I can help them with a, a wide range of things pertaining to their life and their land and livelihood and that kind of thing. So that's, that's, a, that's a privilege, and um, so I enjoy that part of it. Most and and it's it's interesting, you know. You find all of these little nooks and crannies about people's lives, and you know, like I said before, you just try to help them out. <clears throat> How are we doing? We're doing good. All right. What people or ideas or experiences? Would you say have influenced your thoughts about the job? Um, predecessors mostly. So um, Harold Makepeace was the town clerk when I was a kid, um, and I remember him quite well. And interviewed him about being the town clerk actually about fifteen, yeah, fifteen years ago, something like that. He's he's deceased now. Um, so anyway, and then it's also uh, over time, like I was mentioning the land record books. It's pretty amazing. You go back. Uh, someone, uh, like in the summers often when people are out traveling, they're visiting Vermont and they're trying to find their ancestors. So I'll go back into the land records and find their great, 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 great grandfather's family, you know, their wife and all the children has their birth dates and death dates and stuff like that. And so again, you're helping them find a piece of their own history. That's pretty cool, and and the other town clerks you start to I start to recognize <clears throat> uh, Albert Prouty, E. P. Adams, uh, these various town clerks who've been there before me. Now the the main difference between town clerks now and town clerks then is anytime someone registered a deed here, you know, property transferred, they had to take the the deed as it was written and copy it into the land record books by hand. And now all we do is um, photocopy them. So that's a little bit different. Mm. How do you say the job of town clerk has changed over the, your career thus far? Uh, more and more we rely on the computer. I'd say that's the biggest thing. In I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with that, um, you know, and so I, the, uh, a lot of what we do on the computers is a lot more efficient and it actually speaks to what I was just saying about we used to, the town clerks used to have to copy huge amounts of stuff by hand, now it's mostly, you know, copying and pasting stuff, um, uh, you know, using the computer. So that's a big part of what we do in the record keeping is all done with the computer as well. In your opinion, what are some of the difficulties that you and town clerks of small towns face today? Um, mostly just fractious um, stuff with landowners, property owners, um, and elections. Elections are difficult, as I said. Again, you're trying to find, you're trying to make a, a, a safe and um, sort of equitable space for everyone to vote and that they should vote how they think, not how someone else thinks they should vote. And that's the, the climate in which that works can be difficult to, to come up with sometimes. So. Will you please describe a typical day at work from when you leave home until you get home? Sure. Um, so the office opens at 9 a.m. I usually get here at 8.30. I open the vault. I um, check the mail. Uh, 
and just get ready for the day. I spend a fair amount of time answering emails because increasingly that's how people communicate with me and that's fine with me because what I like about email is that I can respond to them when I can. The thing about the phone is that because I'm open, as you've seen already twice, I have to answer the phone. I can't ignore it. I can't just like, oh yeah, I just didn't feel like answering the phone. That's what I do when I'm at home. <laughs> but not here. So I have to answer the phone. And the main thing about my job is that I get interrupted constantly. Constantly. I'll be doing something, I'll be, you know, uh, doing some land reporting or, uh, you know, helping someone fill out a, 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 a marriage license. Um, what's it called, an application or something, something like that, and the phone rings and I stop, so I have to multitask pretty much all day. And there are times, there are days that are slow and the phone doesn't ring and I'm able to get stuff done, you know, be able to put one thought in front of another, and other days when it's just bananas the entire day. Ring. Ring, yeah, and just people walking in and I'm on the phone and, you know, if you're on the phone, I'm talking on the phone, they called first, but then the person is standing there and they're shifting their weight back and forth and they really want to talk to me and ask me a question and i got to, like, work it out. What are some of the more important ways does your job benefits individuals and the town? Hmm? Try that again. What? What are some of the more important ways does your job benefits individual in the town? Benefits individuals? Uh, I mean, I think mostly just, um, you know, knowing people and being a lister and being a town clerk is great because, like, the listers go and visit properties. You know, we go and we measure and we, we document each property and how big it is, how many buildings there are, how many acres, all that kind of stuff. So that allows me to interface with the people who have purchased it. So the first thing that happens is I get these, this paperwork in the mail, and we, we record the deeds and the land records, and all I see is names on a page. But then when I'm a lister, I get to go visit them at their house and walk through their house. So it's pretty cool. I get to know them people, and, and a lot of people who move here from, from other places, they don't know anything about Vermont or what the culture is here or what is expected of them as landowners. So it's fun to, to talk to them about that, help them figure out where they take their trash. And, I mean, some of the stuff is mundane and some of it is like, uh, you know, how to go in the woods and look for your property markers or something like that. What are, what are some of the parts of your job you really like? Um, I mean, I like helping people mostly. I mean, I'd say that sort of boils down to it, and I and I really like the historical part of it, and and I see myself, I see myself as in a continuity with all of these other people who've been town clerk, and they've all been just members of the town, just like me, no different. Um, in fact, town clerks, um, the house that I grew up in, uh, where David and Michelle Holtz that folded, that was the town clerk in the uh, 1940s actually lived there. There was no town office. So the town clerk had all of the town records there in that house, and they were in a uh, in a vault actually. And um, I think in 1948 their house caught on fire, and a number of the records in the vault there's a, a certain um, section that the books got really badly burned. Um, so I could open one of those up and you see it. The book has been restored, but it's absolutely black, charred down the middle, and so there are some records that were just lost altogether in the fire. Um, so anyway, it's it's cool, you know. It's like so. So I know that about um, our own land records, and that's just a story that really happened. Are there parts of your job you dislike or wish you didn't have to do? <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, you know, having your leg chewed on by something, whether it's real or imagined, um, having to do with their property. It's the, no, no one likes being yelled at, and that happens. You know, people. Uh, some people get kind of unhinged about this. Or, in a lot of cases, <clears throat> what I realize after the fact is they're upset about something else, but I'm the person here, I'm a sitting duck. You know, they can come in here and yell at me, and maybe they feel better about themselves, and I don't enjoy it. But um, if they leave and feel like, oh, okay, well, at least someone listened to me, then okay. You know, but I don't, I don't really enjoy that part of it. <laughs> and um, as I think I said before, uh, you know, I, elections are vital. They're so important. I don't personally enjoy them that much. I find them really stressful. But maybe it'll get easier as I, the more I do them. 
What do you see in the future for the town clerk in Marlboro and in other small towns in Vermont? Yeah. Um, one of the big things, uh, you know, in the future, I think, is going to be um, having to do with the land records and how we, if we're going to computerize the records. Um, and it's a really, it's a di really difficult uh, thing to know what to do because it's, as I stated before, it's pretty amazing to go back there and find a record from 250 years ago. I mean, we can read it, you know, right out of the page, no problem. Now, if you go ahead, fast forward 250 years, is the computer that I'm working with, do you think in 250 years someone's going to be able to read any of the stuff that I've written on there? Probably not. So, exactly. So those are the kinds of difficulties where we have to both, you know, say, hey, it's really important that we have technology and that we use it, but not losing sight of the fact that we're trying to make a permanent record and no one knows how long computer stuff will last. But we know how long paper will last. <laughs> now, a few questions about your job as a lister. Sure. What is the job of a town lister? Yep. Uh, we're the tax assessors for the town. What so. Some of the duties? Yep. So we go. Um, so I would like, for instance, every year, um, townspeople will take out a permit to say, "Hey, I want to build a garage, uh, or or a house, or any number of structures in town." Um, so we have that list and then we go and we contact them and we go and do an inspection of their property. Uh, so then we show up and there's a barn or, you know, and it's half built and we measure it and we come up with a, a quality grade and we value it. So that, so what it is is it's, we then send a, a, a piece of paper to the people and say, well, we think your barn is worth $30,000. And then that's what they'll be taxed on. Hard. Yeah. There's some really large bars and or you know that kind of thing or a house you know and we have to we have to have a rationale and we it's a, it's a very detailed job which I really enjoy. Did you become a lister first and town clerk second or the other way around? Yes I was a lister and I still am a lister. Why did you want to be a lister? What do you like about the job? Um, it's uh, I think I explained earlier how I started when I moved back to Marlboro um, and I did the photography project of um, taking pictures of people in front, standing in front of their houses. Um, <clears throat> that's where I, I was passionate about it. I did it for, uh, well, it's about a year and a half project, but, um, but a lot of those pictures, the people in it are dead now. And so it's a it's a it's a historic record of the town as it was in 1999, just before all of you were born. Uh, so, anyways, so that process I think made being a lister interesting to me because again I'm going to visit properties and and meet people, townspeople. Okay. I guess I should shorten up my answers, huh? You got two more pages? Of Hit me. What's next? Um, what would you do if you were not working? What has been one of the more of the more amusing or difficult this experience you've had as a lister? Uh, the worst thing by far is tax appeals. So it's where the listers have come up with a value for a property, <clears throat> and the the property owner says, "No, no, no, that's way too much. You've charged me way too much." You're and oftentimes they think it's personal, which is hilarious, <laughs> uh, because it's not personal. It's just. It's our opinion of what they built, and yeah, well, and so they think you're trying to get me, you're trying to squeeze tax dollars out of me, and we don't really see it that way at all. That can be really, really difficult. Um, we've also seen everything you can possibly imagine, all kinds of illegal things uh, in people's properties. Um, we've seen a wide, wide, wide range of housekeeping, <laughs> how people keep their houses. Some people have stuff absolutely chock-a-block everywhere. Other people have almost nothing in their houses and everything in between. So it's pretty cool. You get to see what people care about and what they don't care about. And it's not, we're not judging them. We're, we're just measuring and listing. <laughs> Is there any crossover between the jobs of Lister and Town Clerk? Are there any conflicts? Um, no, there are not really any conflicts, and there's a huge amount of crossover because, again, it's when my job is to help people uh, 
you know, in town and they're asking me questions or want to know stuff, because I'm a lister and I've been to the properties, it's pretty helpful. Uh, and, and so, like I said before, when a property changes hands and there's a new owner, I get to see it from the deed all the way to meeting the person and, and seeing what they're doing with their property. Who are the other listeners currently serving in Melbourne? Yep, um, Evan Wise is the chair. He's also the assistant town clerk just recently. Um, and he's been a lister since 2003. So he and I have been listers for 15 years. Uh, and the other lister is um, Eric Matt, who's Dave Matt's son. Uh, he lives on Otter Hill Road. And he's a computer whiz, which helps. You know, you guys know Eric Matt, right? And you've done Makers. Oh, I live on Otter Hill Road, so yeah. yeah. Oh, you yeah, drive by his house every day. I have a Makers Club. The Makers Club. Yeah. That, that Eric, he's also a lister. Okay, now a few questions about your work as a photographer. Sure. <laughs> Who have you studied photography with? Photo photography, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a big, scary word. Um, let's see, my college... With wall my, Yeah, my college professor was Stephen Shore. Um, and the main thing that I learned from Stephen was uh, use a... An, or I have in the past, it's, I haven't used it in a little while now, um, is an 8x10 view camera. So you guys have probably seen like pictures of old time photographers and they're like under a hood looking oh, at yeah. a camera on a tripod. Yeah. yeah. So the film in that, the film, like the negative is 8x10 inches. So the thing is like the size of a television <coughs> on a tripod. Uh, and it, um, I shot uh, the, it's black and white film. You can get color film, but I use black and white. Um, and it makes just unbelievably sharp pictures so it, it as a describing tool compared to the digital cameras is just like in a totally different meaning um, so anyway so I studied with Stephen and the, the using the 8x10 camera was and the techniques and ways of seeing and stuff is what I learned from him. What photographers are among your favorites or who you feel have influenced your work? Sure um, let's see, Porter Thayer was a photographer in the early 1900s from, uh, who lived in Newfane. Um, he has lots of photographs. He has actually been, your, he has a bunch of pictures of your house when oh, it was a school yeah. house. Are, I've seen so many of those. Yeah, they're pretty amazing. The you know, ones. there's like, just zooming back in time. Um, because the camera describes so clearly, you can see what kids are wearing. A bunch of the kids in a lot of those have no shoes on, which yeah. is interesting. They still have a big... Like schoolhouse eighteen. Yeah, the sign on the front. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Have that. No, it's totally cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, so Porter Thayer, uh, in terms of <coughs> excuse me, pictures around here. Um, I uh, Darius Kinsey was a large format camera photographer out in the Pacific Northwest, um, and then twentieth uh, century photographer is probably Frederick Sommer, is a um, a guy who when I lived in New Mexico I went and visited. He was ninety when I went and visited him. Wow. Uh, he was. A, extraordinary photographer um, and uh, I learned a lot from Emmett Gowan as well he's, um, he's still alive uh, he taught at um, Princeton University for a long time what? can you tell me a little bit about how you feel those artists have influenced you sure um, I think the main thing about going to school for something like photography or, or any of the arts is um, on a lot of levels you're there to learn the techniques and be influenced by the way people think about stuff but then <clears throat> once you take that information you have to really go out and figure out what you want to say so you can be fascinated and study other people's work really closely and that's so important for defining yourself or helping you define yourself but then at some point you have to kind of copy yourself you have to follow your own voice and um, that that's a lifetime's work right there why do you make the effort to become a professional photo Photographer. Yeah, photographer. <laughs> Wait, so Wait. say the original, what was the other part of the question? What kind of effort? What? What did you make the effort to become a professional oh, why? photographer in the first place? Why did you make the effort? Um, I think since I was a little kid, I 
uh, I felt like vision was one of my superpowers. You know, looking at stuff really carefully. Um, so photography was pretty natural for me, and and I, <clears throat> I actually I started taking pictures. I took my first photography class in high school, uh, and then, but it's interesting to go back also into our like family snapshots and see pictures that I took when I was like your age. And, you know, they were accidents mostly, but you guys all take pictures, right? Yep. On a phone or with the digital cameras. My sister does like a photography class too. Oh yeah, she down an Insight. Yeah. Yep. I think so, yeah. Jess and I ran that program for a while, so yeah, it's pretty amazing. Pretty cool. And, and you know, it's like self-discovery. You learn a lot about yourself, what you think. It, I mean, and when, you're, when it's like, go take pictures. Well, what are you going to take pictures of? Well, what are you interested in? Yeah, you know what I mean? You have to start thinking, like, well, why do I care about this? How do you decide what you want to photograph? Is there a preliminary research involved before you begin? Begin. Yeah, to a degree, I you know you you have to kind of follow your guts as to what it is you think is interesting, and then once you get there, you have to figure out how to describe it. I mean, that's what photography photography is pointing at things basically. You know, unlike something like drawing or painting, where you start with nothing and you have to bring everything to it. With photography, the entire world is around you, and the light is constantly changing. And a photograph is nothing more than recording what light hitting surfaces is. <laughs> so if you think about it that way, that's kind of like abstract. Um, but then you think, well, why, you know, if you keep finding yourself at the zoo, why do you think you're at the zoo? Because you like animals? Because you love the smell? I mean, I don't, I don't know. But so you have to ask yourself those kinds of questions. Who or what experience have you kept? have kept you engaged in your practice of photography? Um, well, so, because I've lived here in Marlboro most of my life, um, I'm fascinated by how, so basically I keep photographing things in Marlboro because to me all of those things together are the sort of record of my experience living here. Um, so that's why I keep doing it. Because, you know, who knows what the bottom of South Pond looks like, but I've gone out and taken pictures of it. And the bottom? Yeah. And it's pretty cool. And that's in Monroe. You know, so I, I'm always trying to expand and explore, um, you know, everything. The practice of photography has changed dramatically over the course of the, your career. Would you please describe your process for making images with your large format camera? Sure very slow, ponderous process. Um, so you set the, tri well first of all you have to figure out what it is you're taking a picture of. Then you have to set up the tripod just like you guys did. Then you have to set up the camera. Uh, and you take pictures unlike with the digital camera where you can hold down the shutter or you guys are, you guys are both shooting video and still images at the same yeah. time. With the, di with the 8x10 camera you can only take one Single frame at a time, and it's, I've taken as long as an hour and a half to set up a single picture. Ugh. And sometimes you have to wait for the light to be the way you want it to be. So yeah, it's it's very detailed, and it takes a huge amount of concentration. That that to me is the biggest difference between digital and film, is that with film, particularly when you're working at two dollars a shot, you know, the, each sheet of film would be two dollars. Uh, you have to think carefully, work slowly. Do you still use the film camera, or do you work in the digital only at this point? Um, mostly digital. Film is even more expensive than when I was using it. Uh, and the, but also, um, I would process all my own film, so which means develop it, which means standing over trays of chemicals while you, and I did a lot. And the thing is, is that you're, it's, it's, chemi it's chemistry, you know, it's, it's, um, they're mostly salts, um, but it's just not good to breathe. And so after 10 years of working in the dark room, I'm kind of like, hey, I can take pictures with a digital camera and they look pretty good. I'm happy. It's not the same thing, though. It's not the same thing. What are some of the advantages of each format? I mean, film is sharper. Film, ha film I think, is more realistic. I think it's closer to the way we see. And I think digital, a lot of the time, is too correct. 
it's too, it's, you know, our, it like, you know when you're, in, if you're inside your, you're inside your house, and you step outside on a bright sunny day, your eyes correct for the brightness of the sky and stuff like that, a digital camera will balance all of those things in an instant and take a picture, and it's not really the way we see. Whereas I think with film, the, the it, film is lights, a light sensitive surface that the light is accumulating on. And so it just has a very different quality to it. Would you give me a brief overview of your career thus far, some personal highlights of your career? In all of these things or just in photography? What do you think? Here's your project for photography. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I had a I had a series of pictures um, in the uh, that were shown in Brooklyn, New York, which was that was pretty cool to have a, an opening and be able to go down to New York and have other people there looking at my pictures on the wall. Um, I've created uh, um, well, probably two different versions of a book of all of the pictures that I've taken in Marlboro. Um, so I'd, I'd say I'd rank those as among, you know, and, and I had a show actually um, that traveled to a number of different locations around Vermont that had um, the pictures of people in front of their houses and then there are like short biographies that go with them about, um, about the people's lives. Um, so I think that's some of my favorite work. And I hope to continue it someday, maybe at, maybe at the 25 year anniversary, so in about, about another six, seven, eight years. Maybe I'll do it again. What are some of the char characteristics that an artist should have? Patience. Patience and, and not being afraid to repeat yourself because you have to do that in order to make a breakthrough into something else that you haven't thought of yet. What do you describe some of the types of images you make? Uh, most recently, I've been photographing. You guys know the. You have do any of you use like a um, an iPad, an iPad or an iTouch to take pictures? Yeah. No? Yes. You know the panorama function. Panorama. You know. Yeah. So the the, it pans like this. Yeah. So oh. you, you pan it like this, and it makes a big long picture. Yeah. Oh well, yes. I've, I've been taking a lot of pictures using that function, except using it vertically and taking pictures of trees from the bottom all the way to the top. Uh, so it's this huge, long, stretched so out make thing. You, like, turn it to go up yeah. I mean, I could, I can show you some. I think I have my iPad here. But let me pull one up. Oh, you guys might like this. You see this? Um, I got a shot of it. It's not my gravestone. Oh, okay. It's the gravestone of Forrest Snow, who was someone who, I think he died in like 1910, a long time ago. You died. Well, I don't know. It might be who I'm named after, I don't know. Let's get a good picture of this. <laughs> I'm trying to focus Forrest on this. Here, let me, let, me brighten, <laughs> let me brighten it up a little bit. Oh, nice. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. Um, but let me show you one of the tree pictures. I enjoy it. And so, you know, it's I doing it, and I don't know what it's what it means or what I'm going to do with them, but I just they're a lot of fun. There's one of them. And it's like, hey, it's just a tree. But, you know, I've been reading this book about trees, and it's pretty interesting, um, like bir uh, beech trees in the woods, you know, they're gray bark. Yeah. <clears throat> Scientists think that when you have beech trees that grow all together like that, it's actually one single organism, and they're just bir like different arms from the same creature, which is pretty insane to think about. How would you say your work has changed over your career? What are some of your early interests compared to what are you working on now? Well, that's a huge question. I mean, I don't know. I guess I just keep following what I think is interesting and trying to try to follow what I think is interesting and not tell myself that it's not interesting. <laughs> but to, you know, like, a, like the thing about the zoo, you know, if you, if you find yourself keep going to the zoo, why do I keep going to the zoo? 
because I'm interested in this. <laughs> How do you decide what images you're going to make prints of? Gut instinct. Something that's interesting to me. I can't always explain why. Would you give an example of your process for making a finished print from first idea to completion? Uh, I'm sure. Uh, I don't know. Again, it's it's a question of what. Uh, and the the main thing about printing is knowing what you want the end product to look like, and that just takes time and, and personal preference. What inspires you? Um, landscape and people mostly. You know, I don't. Uh, I don't know. And I, I think mostly I just, I like taking pictures in this town because I, I think uh, as a record of a single place, there's a lot of stuff to look at and a lot of things to think about. Can we stop for a second? Please. The camera's going to die.